Hello and welcome to the special show. We've got Warren Edward Buffett with us here on his maiden tour in India at 81. He's still raring to go. What does he have in store for India? Let's start by chatting with Mr. Buffett. Thanks so much for joining us. First off, let's pick up your investments. Very, very tough moments, especially during the curve of the recession. You went out there, you looked at JP Morgan and said, okay, I'm going to help save a bank that was almost failing at one stage. What drives this thinking? What drives your investment strategy? Or is that the Buffett style? Well, it's, it's, it's what I like to do. I like to spend the time, uh, the day, working with businesses, working with people I like. Uh, uh, I like watching Berkshire grow. It's, it's a never-finished painting. I mean, every day when I go to the office, I feel that there's a chance of adding to the painting. And uh, I can't think of anything I'd rather do in the world. Let me also bring up something that another very recent global visitor said. Vikram Pandit of Citibank was in town and he highlighted how the next decade is not going to be so much about economic development but about political stories. How will the uh, you know, politics of uh, global nations really play out? Do you agree with that theory? Do you think that's really going to be the dominant theme in the years ahead? Well, that, they may be right in, in, in some aspect of how they see the world. It, it, I, I, that does not change my view of what we do one, one bit. I mean, I, I'm going to do the same thing. I don't care what Citibank is forecasting. Or, uh, there will always be things going on uh, with governments in the world. And in the end, it won't make any difference. What makes a difference is whether we own the right businesses run by the right people and whether we're delivering products and services that people want. And I, I have never in any way had an investment decision, whether in stocks, bonds, or an entire business, that has been affected in one, one iota by any view about what the world is going to do or some macro view or something like that. My partner, Mr. Martin, and I have worked together for 50 years. We don't discuss, when we look at buying a business, we don't discuss anything about the world economy or what may happen or world tensions or anything of the sort, because we're buying the business for keeps. And the world's going to be here 10 years from now and 20 years from now. And we want businesses that are going to be serving more and more people when that time comes. When you look at driving sectors of growth, uh, where do you see the true growth impulses coming in? Where is Buffett's eye? What are you narrowing down on? What sectors do you think could be the true stories that will deliver what you have actually so far seen in terms of earnings? We actually don't look for the growth sectors. We, I, I mean, we love growth when we find it but we're perfectly willing to buy businesses that are relatively slow growth. Uh, uh, growth does not drive our investment decisions. Uh, competitive advantage, good management, honest management, a sensible price, an ability to see where the company may be in 5 or 10 or 20 years, that's what drives our, our, our uh, investment decisions. But I do not sit and rank industries by their growth potential at all. It, uh, I am perfectly willing to go into a business that is not going to grow at all. I'd rather have it grow, but I'm perfectly willing to go into businesses that, that, that don't grow if they're good, good, solid, fundamental businesses. A quick question on the macroeconomic situation. Asian central banks are worth not, uh, noticing at this stage. They seem to be trying to stay ahead by keeping uh, the interest rate under a quick check. They're making sure, especially in China, for example, there have been several rate hikes. India has been closed. Do you think that's the ideal strategy for Asian central banks to do, uh, keep ahead of the curve and keep interest rates tight? Well, central banks have to look at their country by country obligations and conditions. I mean, conditions in Brazil are not the same as the conditions in the United States, and they're not the same as conditions in, in Germany. So each central bank has a responsibility uh, in terms of its own charter. Uh, we've given our own central bank in, in the United States this dual responsibility in terms of inflation and unemployment. Uh, but central banks generally, uh, they're going to be run in a conscientious way. Uh, they're going to be run in an intelligent way. And sometimes they'll make mistakes. Most of the times they'll get it right. I have no idea about any given country central bank policy now. I do think in the United States, the central bank has used most of the bullets that it has when it gets interest rates down to practically nothing. And we have this great fiscal stimulus going on in the United States by a budget deficit of 10% of GDP. I actually think that fiscal and monetary policy are important tools in an economy, but I think they are far less important than actually the natural resilience, say in the United States at least, of 
of, of, of capitalism and the market system. I think what, what will cause the United States to progress out of the recession it was in and into new prosperity um, may be helped in some ways by fiscal and monetary policy, but overwhelmingly it will be produced by individuals who are thinking as we speak here about how to turn out something better tomorrow uh, for a huge market and uh, uh, you know whether Steve Jobs is going to come out with something new at Apple, if, 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 if Microsoft comes up with something new, uh, Amazon figures out a better way to distribute goods to people. All of those things are moving the economy forward and they're far more important in the end than the central bank. In the same way, in talking about QE2, how concerned are you about the role that the Federal Reserve is playing? And looking at uh, Ben Bernanke, he was hailed a hero once upon a time. Do you think that's uh, something he's lived up to? Is he truly still the hero of uh, American macroeconomic policy? Well, I, I, I think that Chairman Bernanke was a huge hero in the fall of 2008 and made some very courageous major decisions that kept that panic from developing into something far worse than it did. Uh, I don't think now it's as important to have uh, the central bank's foot on the pedal of expansion uh, as it was back then. And I think uh, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm no fan of even more fiscal stimulus than, uh, uh, or monetary stimulus than we've had. Let's talk about the American economy, Mr. Buffett. You've been talking about it in uh, great positive words since the time you've arrived in India. Talk to us about why you're positive on the U.S. economy. Where do you truly see the recovery green shoots, so to speak? And if you think that the economy is going to be so strong, then positively, what are we expecting America to deliver? And how uh, do you expect America to deliver? What could be the risks associated with this comeback in the economic recovery? There, there is no risk to the U.S. economy over, over uh, in a longer term. Uh, the U.S. economy is going to do wonderfully over, over, over decades. Now, if you take the next 100 years, there will be 15 years that will be terrible for the economy. I just don't know which 15, and nobody else does either. It's the nature of capitalism and markets that they overshoot and they, they, they sometimes over leverage. And, and we've had 15 recessions or panics in the United States since the country was founded, and we'll have more. But in the end, we always end up moving forward, and that will continue. I have no worries about the U.S. economy over time. But the biggest risk to the world is nuclear, chemical, and biological uh, threats of one sort or another, whether from rogue countries or, or rogue organizations or something of the sort. That threat won't go away. There, are, there will always be people who wish harm on their neighbors. And uh, thousands of years ago, if you wished harm on your neighbor, you picked up a rock and threw it at him, and that was about the limit of the damage you could do. And gradually we went from that to bows and arrows and cannons and so on. Since the atomic bomb in 1945, the capacity to inflict harm on others has increased exponentially. And unfortunately, we've got lots of people in the world. that We've got psychotics, we've got religious fanatics, we've got megalomaniacs, we've got all of these people that uh, really would like to inflict harm on others. And, and they have more capacity to do that in a huge way than existed 75 or 100 years ago. And the world has to learn to unite. Governments have to learn to unite to minimize that danger. Other than that, the future could not be brighter. I want to draw your attention back to uh, the Federal Reserve because at one stage we've heard over the last few hours uh, the Dallas Federal Reserve talking about how you know, the American deficit situation is close to insolvency. Now that's a very strong statement to make. Would you be concerned about that to that effect? Or would you agree with them on this subject? How close it is to insolvency? Would you buy that argument? No. <laughs> the U.S. Is, couldn't be further from insolvent. I mean, it, if you look at the resources of the United States, you know, it is true we are running deficits that, that we should cut back on, and we will, I, I hope, very soon. But we may not. But we ran the, we ran the national debt up to 120% of GDP during World War II, and we came out of it and had a great prosperity subsequently. Uh, the U.S., if you look at the resources of the, the United States, the plants, the innovation, the products that come forth. Uh, and we have this advantage, which is very important, is that we, we owe money in our own currency. I mean, you don't, you don't, you don't get in trouble owing money. You, you avoid a lot of problems by owing, mo owing money in your own currency. The United States is wealthier now, in a real sense, than it's ever been. And it'll get wealth, more wealthy as it goes along, as will India.
Let's talk about the giving pledge. That's primarily, uh, you know, uh, one of the reasons why you're here with uh, Bill Gates. Uh, do you think Indian promoters at many stages have l looked a bit shy, hesitant to part with their money and be a part of the giving pledge that you and Bill Gates are propagating? Do you get that sense? Well, we're not trying to convince them. We're just trying to tell them what we've done. And we don't convince everybody in the United States. I mean, I, everybody's entitled to do what they want to do with their own wealth. What we're saying is we think this is a good idea for us. We've adopted it. Many people in the United States agree with us. Many people don't. And that will be true around the world. Uh, all we want to do is tell people what we've done. If they like the idea, if it fits with their plans, it's terrific. I mean, I, you, you know, you have, um, I believe it was, what, 1917 that Mr. Tata set up the, right. the charitable. I mean, yeah. he, he preceded Andrew Carnegie in a sense. Uh, so th there's been plenty uh, giving is something that transcends borders. I mean, it is, it is an act of humanity. And you have very humane people uh, here and rich humane people in India. And as they think about what they do with their wealth, some will decide to give a significant portion back to society and some won't. But that will be true in the United States or Germany or wherever. I, I do think that when people join the giving pledge, that their act has some influence on others. So I, uh, what, what our hope is that by people joining in on this now, the 20 years from now and 50 years from now, more people of wealth think about giving a significant part back to society. Mr. Warren Buffett, the succession plan that is going to be placed at Berkshire Hathaway, how do you see it happening? And given that your shoes are going to be huge for someone to fill, how, how well and you know, how strong is your succession plan now? Uh, as on today, do you think you put the pieces in place? A majority, when our board of directors meets, a majority of the time is spent talking about succession. And the board has identified four people that any one of the four could step into my shoes and in many respects do a better job. Uh, so if I should die tonight, the board would meet tomorrow morning and they know exactly who they would put in my job as chief executive. And that is a responsibility that I have and the board has always to have a reservoir of at least a few people that could take my position and to have in mind which one they would actually do if it happened immediately. Uh, it's, it's a job that, it, it's the primary job of the board of directors. And, and we are in very good shape on this. We weren't in good shape 30 years ago. I mean, we did not have the reservoir of talent that we have now. Uh, many years ago, my partner, Charlie Munger, would have followed me, but he's older than I am. So between the two of us, we're 167 years old. I mean, so <laughs> we're not, he's not in a position to do it. But we, we, have, we, have, we have at least four. We, there really are more than that, but that's the ones we've identified. Those. What do you think is going to be the challenge of the successor who actually takes up your shoes? Biggest challenge? Well, the biggest challenge is they'll get compared with what I've done. And they will have to establish their own credentials. People, people are used to me. The managers are used to me. People who think about selling their businesses know that I'm kind of a known quantity. So they know how I'm going to behave if they sell their business to me. And the managers know how I'm going to behave when they work with me. And when anybody new comes along, uh, obviously people are going to spend the first year or two forming new judgments about that person. So. In a sense, that person will have to earn his own spurs, in a sense. Uh, but it'll happen. They'll, they'll be a little different than I will. But, but the important thing that they have to preserve is the culture of Berkshire Hathaway, which is, is letting really talented managers run their own businesses, being a wonderful home for people that may have to sell a good business for one reason or another. And that can be done, and it will be done. You've been revered around the world as the best investor ever born. How do you take that adulation and what do you think is uh, you know, going to be your response to your millions and thousands of uh, fans out here about the way you take your success? What is the success mantra of Warren Buffett? I, don't, I just keep doing what I've been doing all my life and what I enjoy. I, it, you know, it's, uh, it's nice to have a lot of investors come to Berkshire Hathaway's annual meeting or something of the sort. But, but I'm just painting the same painting that I've been painting for 60 plus years. And, and it doesn't change my life. I, 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 I go to work at the same time. I eat the same food. I wear the same clothes. Everything. I, I, I have a privileged life, but it's an unchanged life. And I work with people I love around me. They make my life easy. 
So I just can't complain about anything. I'd like to find something to complain about, but I just don't know what it would be. <laughs>